The doctors who took referrals from the clergy could face criminal charges and lose their medical licenses. In spite of these risks, some doctors were moved to act by what they'd seen. The hospitals then would be, would be you know, beds after bed of women with uh, abortion complications. And we were supposed to report these. And I had one that I did report. The police came, they harassed the woman, they threatened her, told her she was going to die, um, frightened her into telling who had done the, 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 the abortion. Um, it's a very bad experience for her. I made a decision then that I would never report that again. Women from all over the country came to Dr. Boyd's office in a small Texas town after he joined the clergy abortion service. To have the service available, safe, and to have it done in, with respect and with dignity, and to know that, that it, your work is, is needed is appreciated and to, to get that reaffirmation every day for patients who you know who you may have never met before you know to have the, the patient look up and say thank you doctor you know, I don't know what you would I would have done if you hadn't have been here or just a simple thank you women who could not find a safe abortion in the United States and were able to leave the country had to take their chances. In Mexico, for example, illegal abortion was a thriving industry with no controls. Of course, there were two levels of abortion providers. There were the ones that were in a very uh, sanitized office. And so the pretty wealthy woman, and they were usually the white women, would go uh, and have an abortion that was done very well. It was, you know, sanitary. It was the doctor was trained. She felt no discomfort. On the other hand, you might have the woman that would be Latina, or maybe not as, as um, wealthy, white American woman that would go to Mexico, and she would have to take what she could get. The leaders of the Society for Humane Abortion went to Mexico to investigate the possibilities. The dangers were terrible. Uh, young women could be intercepted at the airport. Cab drivers knew why they knew why they were there, and they would say, "I want to go so and so," and he would take them elsewhere, where he would be getting a, a, a kickback or a rake off. Telephone operators in the border towns would switch calls to entrepreneurs that didn't know what they were doing. The women didn't know really who they were going to. Pat, Lana, and Rowena compiled a list of reputable doctors with explicit instructions on how to navigate the underground. They would visit the doctors and check their facilities and help the women negotiate fair prices. When the women came back, if we had a single bad report, a single one, that they had mistreated or had done poor surgery or that they had... Uh, in any manner, abused this woman. Their name went right off that list. It was hard, but it was better than picking them up dead in garbage cans in Tijuana, which is what had been happening to them. Although few doctors in the United States were willing to perform abortions, some would risk seeing the patients after the operation. Dr. Cheek helped Lana and Pat by treating women with complications after they returned from Mexico. The only way I could find of, of handling somebody who had had an abortion and who was sick or in pain or running a temperature was to go and see them. And I felt this was an extension of what I really owed myself to do. At that time, I did not have the courage to do abortions myself so much hung in the balance of losing one's license, of going to jail, and I had a family. This was the trap that all of us were sort of caught in. Abortion was something that really needed to be changed in America, that this was criminal. 
In 1967, the state of Colorado and then North Carolina passed the first reform laws in the country. In California, Assemblyman Bielensen reintroduced his bill. Everywhere I went, no matter what kind of group it was, no matter how politically conservative it might be, people would start nodding and realizing this, of course. Uh, for the first time really in their lives, many of them, uh, it, was, it was presented them, to them as a potential political issue, as, uh, as something, as a legislative issue, as something where, where clearly the law ought to be changed. In June of 1967, Bielensen's bill finally passed. But the new law had many bureaucratic restrictions, and as a result, few women were able to get abortions. Reverend Hugh Anwell was among those who had lobbied for the bill. I found myself in the position of being asked to establish some kind of information service that would help women learn about this new law. And to my absolute dismay, we had 293 calls from women who wanted help. And uh, once we climbed from under that, uh, we found that of that number, only three qualified under the law as then it was interpreted in California. So then the next question was, what now? It soon became clear that I was in something that, in my own case, had totally changed my life because you don't um, meet that kind of uh, human need and then say, well, it doesn't concern me anymore. Hugh Anwell contacted me and asked me if I would be a, a counselor uh, representing the South Central area, which is largely the black area of uh, Los Angeles. And in an, uh, a community that uh, has so many persons who are poor, it just seemed to me that those persons who did want to take a step to determine their own future ought to be, uh, ought to be helped without what I would consider violating the laws of God. Peg Bysert was still in training for the ministry when she was approached by her pastor. He asked if I would want to do abortion counseling when I was ordained, and uh, I said, yes, I would. Uh, however, I didn't quite realize that it was going to be so fast. I was ordained on a Sunday afternoon and on a Monday morning, we were at a very large meeting in Rawway, New Jersey, of the uh, clergy counseling group. There must have been at least 100 men there. Uh, when I came in with, with the pastor of the church, uh, there, he announced a woman. <laughs> and uh, there was applause and everyone standing, and, and it was quite a sight. But I realized what it meant to them when all these men had been counseling women about abortion, and there hadn't been a single woman pastor to do this. So I jumped in with two feet. <laughs> the clergy service continued to grow and eventually attracted several thousand members nationwide. I got involved because it felt like a matter of justice and fairness. Uh, and there were victims, and I was concerned about that. We decided to enlist ourselves and take a telephone number, and that was a rather audacious step, especially when the Illinois uh, legislators were really in the very heart of their argumentation and newspapers were editorializing on all sides. I recall the doctor's letters especially because doctors were confessing that they had been doing abortions for years and they said we really are sick and tired of, of having this considered clandestine and illegal. By the end of 1968, calls both for and against decriminalization were escalating. Those opposed to change wanted their message to be heard. 